Okay. Good afternoon. Good evening to uh, our listeners. Uh, welcome to the Washington Outside. The video today is the editor in chief. That's me, Irina Zuckerman, and Dalia Ziada. Uh, we will discuss. Um, we will discuss uh, the UE Turkey relationship, how it affects both countries as well as uh, the region, and we'll also touch on uh, the issues of uh, Qatar and other investments into Egyptian uh, energy market uh, most recently. Uh, Daria will tell you a little bit uh, about her thinking. She is the, the director of the Center for Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean studies, and of course, that's directly relevant to the topic today. Dalia, the floor is yours. Um, please share a little bit about your work and then we'll get right into it. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Rina. I'm always happy to be with you and have these uh, uh, deep discussions with you, thanks to your deep questions and deep knowledge also of our region. Uh, so uh, I'll start by giving uh, a brief uh, explanation to the work I do uh, at the MEME Center. Uh, MEME Center is uh, a center dedicated to studying the growing relationship between the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean regions. And it's not only limited to the Eastern Mediterranean, but the rest of like, you know, the two shores of the Mediterranean, Europe, North Africa, and also uh, parts from Asia, we are seeing in the past uh, two or three years, a growing relation on the level of military, economy, uh, politics, diplomatic relations growing between the parties who are working here and there, or the key players in this region and this region. So I think it's something important to watch in the, in the next years. Uh, given the fact that we are working from Cairo, right in the middle between the three regions uh, I just referred to, uh, we thought, me and some colleagues, that we should start uh, monitoring this these relations and see how they are affecting the future of our of our world not only the middle east region or the eastern mediterranean excellent excellent definitely very important work and i think there will only be more to write uh, do and discuss related to that as this relationship progress and of course today's discussion is directly linked to the subject because as you've noted in your levant news articles U.S. rapprochement to Turkey carries with it certain advantages, but also cha potential challenges to these new relationships. Um, for those who haven't read the article, if you could just give a brief overview of the main points, and then I'll kind of start asking more specific questions. Okay, so, so basically, I'm sure everyone in the world was surprised by the approachment that has been happening for a while uh, between uh, the United Arab Emirates and Turkey, in particular, uh, even more than the, the approachment efforts that happened between, let's say, Egypt and Turkey, Saudi and Turkey, because what was between Turkey and the United Arab Emirates in particular was clear rivalry, clear animosity. They were fighting against each other, literally fighting against each other in, in Libya, in uh, Syria, in different places. And actually, we have seen at, at some moment in 2020, I think in August, in August, yes, in August 2020, uh, the Turkish defense minister, Hulusi Akar, was on uh, Al Jazeera TV, and he made like a statement saying th that uh, he will punish Abu Zabi at the right moment uh, and the right time. But uh, like a few months forward, you are, we are seeing them uh, talking together, shaking hands, and even making agreements about the future. So this tells us that a lot of is changing in our region. Of course, at the beginning, the beginning of this relationship was pushed by, but uh, I, I, like, I like to call uh, panic diplomacy, which happened all over the region, by the way, in all countries after the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. Especially in the Gulf region, there was a state of panic, like all of a sudden they have to deal with Taliban, uh, they, there is a threat coming to them. The Gulf has the Gulf region or the Gulf countries uh, was uh, the on, or has been the only stable region in the Middle East since the Arab Spring. It was the only regions that remained stable and remained working and remained uh, even producing and also played key role in balancing the messy politics that followed 
the Arab Spring. So now they are under direct threat. They found themselves under direct threat. All the Gulf countries started to uh, panic a little bit and started to make new coalitions. They started to look for rival, uh, even started to approach those whom they have problem with more than those who are uh, in good terms with. So we have seen uh, Qatar, for example, enhancing its relationship with Egypt even farther after the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates looking forward to opening even to Iran and to Turkey and in, in a way that no one expected. <clears throat> of course, as we know, the United Arab Emirates are very clever in, in making things happen. They just, you know, they, they, they don't even talk the talk, they walk the walk immediately. So they, they are very clever in making things happen. So I think that's why they immediately thought like, not wasting time, in the same week the US withdrew from Afghanistan, they contacted the Turkish uh, presidency and they, uh, Sheikh Tahnoun, the national security advisor of the United Arab Emirates traveled to uh, Turkey and met with the President Erdogan and they started a relationship already uh, that we have seen later uh, this, uh, this month, er, no, last month, at the end of last month, they signed the contracts and, uh, and investments w uh, amounted to $10 billion. It's huge, huge uh, uh, amount, huge investments, and also tells that maybe there is a future for this uh, relationship. But when we look deep inside, is this really a relationship that is made to last? We will discover that perhaps not. It seems that the United Arab Emirates is seeing in Turkey, of course, uh, as I told you earlier, like um, we have to be good with our enemies because the region is not a stable state anymore. So they have to make sure that Turkey is not uh, going to cause trouble to them if it started working in Afghanistan or working with Qatar and so. And at the same time, of course, UAE is a big investor in the region, and they found a very good investment opportunity in Turkey now, given the declining lira and, uh, and uh, the struggling Turkish economy. So they found or thought this is a good opportunity. At the same time, Turkey needs money. So they looked at the United Arab Emirates as, you know, a, 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 or the United Arab Emirates offer, I mean, as a booster shot to their economy. And what I'm what I think why, uh, yani the reason why I think uh, this relationship is going to last because it does not follow the pattern of the relationships that Turkey usually do with its close allies or the countries that it really wants to build a long term relationship with. Factor here is the defense factor or defense cooperation factor. Mm -hmm. We have seen uh, Turkey and United Arab Emirates signing a wide range of contractors, all of them are economic and the trade contractors, but nothing related to defense cooperation. Turkey, like when you mention Turkey, you have to mention military diplomacy. When military diplomacy is absent, know that this is not uh, an relationship that they want to last for a long time. A few weeks after that, the United Arab Emirates started to uh, uh, approach uh, uh, approach to, uh, to uh, offer cooperation in the defense sector. And even the, uh, uh, some officials inside Turkey, like the uh, head of, uh, of uh, the, the defense industry's presidency, it's the official agency that is responsible for defense industry in uh, Turkey, welcomed that. And he said, maybe there is a potential for this cooperation, given the fact that uh, according to official statistics uh, by the Turkish government, uh, the United Arab Emirates invested $90 million in uh, purchasing weapons and the armies and the munitions from Turkey only in the first quarter of 2021. So there is already a relationship, but again, it's not a defense cooperation relationship. It's only like, you know, investment in the defense sector, buying and selling, not, not an actual defense relationship. Like for example, the one Turkey is having with Qatar. 
where it's uh, exporting weapons, providing training and consultancy to the military in Qatar and even having a military base in Qatar. I don't see this happening with the United Arab Emirates. And uh, of course, Turkey will be very careful not to do that in order not to lose Qatar also. Uh, as 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 its uh, uh, number one ally in the Gulf region, so it like I'm curious, like everyone else, to see where this relationship is going to lead. But of course, I'm not very optimistic about it. Now I have many questions directly related to that. But before I start with the juicy stuff, I want to address an issue that some may find a little bit boring, but I think actually central to this whole issue, which is the effect of UAE's and other countries' investments on the Turkish economy. Some have sarcastically commented that now that the Turkish lira actually fell below the Egyptian pound for the first yeah. time, um, that all these investments notwithstanding, really nothing is happening. Now, the reality is a lot of the time these investments, first of all, they address specific sectors of the economy, and second, uh, they take time to take effect. Could you tell us about what you see in terms of these trends? For where exactly ha has the UAE invested its money? And do you expect the lira to stabilize after some time or not? You know, no, actually, according to uh, all, all the, or the majority, let's say, of uh, the analysts, the economic analysts about the Turkish lira, no one is optimistic about it. Everyone is thinking that President Erdogan is becoming very stubborn. He insisted, uh, he insisted on keeping the interest low, uh, the interest rate at the lowest uh, level, which is harming even the Turkish lira more. But also we had I, I would I would remember like we had a similar experience in Egypt when we had a huge inflation happening and so and we were able to recover from that in a matter of five or seven years and e the Egyptian economy now is is uh, having very high expectations by the International Monetary Fund that it may be uh, it may become the second largest economy in uh, 2000 and uh, by the end of 2022. Uh, uh, the, the second largest in Africa after Nigeria and the second largest in uh, all the Arab countries after Saudi Arabia. That's, that's a great position for the Egyptian economy. But the question is, Egypt, like when we had this, we were having a clear economic reform plan that helped us uh, get to this point. This is not existing in Turkey right now. Add to this, of course, the, all the political troubles that are going inside the huge corruption. Yes, the people want to help their countries. They want to keep things going. But unfortunately, the regime is not, is not that uh, smart or that uh, or working in, I don't know. They are not adopting the right agenda that should make us optimistic that the lira would improve, let's say, in one or two years or so. Uh, there is no clear economic reform plan, just promises. For the United Arab Emirates or foreign investors, yes, of course, this is a great opportunity. I like anyone, if, if there is a, because I think the United Arab Emirates or any other investor who are looking at Turkey now is not looking to invest for, for a couple of months and go. They are thinking of years. So I think in that term, yes, of course, eventually the United Arab Emirates will be able to uh, get uh, the, the results it wants or to get more money as it wants in the future. But most importantly for the, the United Arab Emirates is not only investment, but also kind of, I know it's a tough word, but buying Turkey on its side mm -hmm. by paying this money. So, so I think this is the main goal for the United Arab Emirates now, uh, but Turkey also is playing smart. They are saying, okay, we will cooperate so you can help us with the money, but we will not open up to you the same way we are opening to our real allies like Qatar, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about Islamists and whether Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood will be true or not, but from what I've seen, some of them left the country, but for entirely economic reasons that have nothing to do with UAE influence, but simply with the state of a 
that economy and looking for better opportunities in Europe. What actually happens remains to be seen, but Erdogan is facing elections. He needs investments, he needs something before elections, but at the same time, it's clear that his own uh, agenda is not working. But the question is, does he really want it to work? Is, you know, is he looking to stabilize the lira or in seeking investments, is he looking for something else? I think that yes, of course, he wants it to work and he, he of course hopes that maybe the situation improves in the next year or two so he can again uh, keep his voter base and win in the elections in 2023. Or at least if he's not going to win, his party will remain in power under another name or another president. But uh, the way he's doing is not the right way. Like, you know, there is a good saying that says prejudice blinds. Prejudice makes people blind. And I think Erdogan is somehow blinded by this prejudice he's having that he, he knows better. He knows Turkey better than anyone else. He's refusing to listen to any economic advice from any uh, anyone and insisting on his same economic policies that brought the country to this point. Uh, and no one can do anything with it. Also, there is another dimension to this is that Turkey is a country uh, that is that depends a lot on uh, uh, importing raw material materials of all almost all the industries it have, starting from clothes to furniture to even to the military industry. It depends on importing raw materials from abroad, and this will if if the lira is not fixed in in let's say in six months from now or so, it will be a big problem to the uh, the pr production inside Turkey to the industry general industry inside Turkey, and this is something the the Turkish president and the Turkish regime have to understand and realize before it's too late. Uh, speaking about the Islamists, you you mentioned a good point. Actually, all of them now are giving up on Erdogan, and uh, they are leaving the country. They thought like they would uh, after after you know escaping from Egypt and going to Turkey, they will find uh, uh, heaven there. And uh, but they didn't. Now they are suffering, and they are even considering other options. Well, it's the economy that has actually brought um, Erdogan to power to begin with, and it's actually and strengthened his base, but it could be his own undoing if he does not come up with some better option. At the same time, there's little talk of other potential candidates in the election. So it's really kind of surprising that even while completely failing, Erdogan seems to be at the forefront of the discussion. Um, and no one is talking about rapprochement with his opponents, for instance. Our poor economy would have been a good opportunity for UE and others to bring Erdogan down. He does not have a lot of time before the election. In this year, if the economy keeps crashing, there would be little he could do in terms of uh, competing with other countries. It would have been a good time to uh, actually pressure him more. But it's interesting that um, Instead, uh, he's almost being propped up despite doing everything possible to uh, to sabotage his own uh, his own uh, economy. Yeah. Why that is remains to be seen. I have some guesses, but instead of relying on speculations, I want to talk about facts. Um, we we um, there are specific segments of the economy in which UAE and other countries are investing in. Besides that, uh. They had one of the subjects of the recent discussions during these investment talks was the creation of a trade route that would bypass the Suez Canal and would connect um, UAE to Iran and to Turkey and thus essentially create a new trade relationship between those countries. Can you explain what effect that would have on Egypt if it were to happen, how likely it is to happen, and what what is going to be the effect on the region? And I'm, deliberately trying to stay away from emotional language. I know that many people are panicking, but I want to focus on 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 concrete concrete potential effects of this. Yes. So actually what we have been seeing happening for a while is that the United Arab Emirates is trying to um, 
distinguish itself somehow from the region like play or let's say they don't want play within the team they want to play alone and actually they they have somehow the right to feel this way because the united arab emirates is now reaching a very advanced level on a very adva like a very advanced stage on many levels uh, economic level uh, cultural level even in media in uh, in many ways in military level even they are becoming what they call a little sparta and uh, actually if the united arab emirates was to receive uh, uh, the, or to complete the F-35 deal, it was going to be the most advanced country uh, technologically and militarily in uh, in the Arab uh, in all the Arab countries. So this means that okay, the United Arab Emirates have this ambition to play alone. So we have seen in the past few months it has started to separate itself from egypt after this you know th there was very strong connection between ue and egypt in the past five years let's say or even more than that but suddenly they started to look for other partners and so one of the things they offered as soon as they started approaching with uh, Turkey, is this road, this straight road that would be a replacement to the Suez Canal. Of course, it's an ambitious project, but is it, uh, is it uh, applicable? Is it possible? Actually, no, because there is no alternative to Suez Canal, I think, because it's the cheapest, the fastest, and building any other road if you look at the map you're talking about a road that will go through iran with all the troubles that are there in iran and then from there to turkey and you have iraq and syria with the ter terrorists there at that border it's very complicated and not a safe road to think of and it will cost a lot of money and a lot of effort a lot of a lot of uh, even time and uh, investments to even secure uh, the goods passing there so up till this moment, the world has no better way and safer way than the Swiss Canal. Uh, also, uh, we have seen the UEE offering this, but we did not see Turkey responding to this, mm -hmm. like uh, either accepting it or thinking of it, because Turkey is having another ambitious project with, uh, with the axis of Pakistan, Qatar, uh, to make uh, another railway, to make a railway between the three of them that connect is uh, Europe, Eurasia, and uh, Eurasia, I mean, and uh, and Asia. So there is there is another project already to the one the UAE is trying to implement. So I think from all these suggestions and and even similar to uh, the roads that uh, the United Arab Emirates offered to do with Israel. Uh, through the Elad port, and then the Israeli government said they cannot do this because uh, uh, for environmental reasons, and also uh, uh, they cannot implement the project. So all these uh, attempts, I think it's mainly uh, because uh, uh, the United Arab Emirates wants to play alone, wants to prove that it is like the strongest, the best, the, the, the biggest country or the big sister of the Gulf and, and the Arab region. So it's part of the Emirati ambition, I would say. Now, I'm going to be a little bit provocative and uh, I'm going to ask, UAE has criticized Qatar for doing exactly the same thing. So why are they choosing this approach now? And don't you think that this trend of smaller Gulf states breaking away and pursuing their own track threatens GCC unity and threatens MENA region and Arab League and all these alliances. Are we seeing everyone for themselves now or are we seeing emergence of new alliances? What 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 is the general direction of all of this? I'm sorry, I lost you for a minute. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, I was- Internet I, I was, interruption. Uh, um, my question was, you know, you could say Qatar for doing the same thing. Do you think the strength of smaller GCC states, um, what, what does it mean for the, does it mean the breakup of the GCC? Does it mean that everyone now is out for themselves? Does it mean an emergence of some mm -hmm. new alliances in the region and the breakdown of the Arab League? What's going on here? Yeah, so it's a, it's a very, very good question and also very good observation to what's happening in the region. So when we look at the map, we have uh, the map of the Gulf region. We have this huge chunk, Saudi Arabia, taking the majority of the region. And then uh, about four or five small countries 
on the side of Saudi Arabia. Two of these countries are Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. Both are having very high GDP, are very ambitious. Uh, both are led by forward thinking leaders. They are, uh, you know, they, the competition between them has existed forever since the foundation of the two countries actually. So this competition will remain forever. And also add to this the tribal factor. It's two tribes, like think of them not as two states, but as two tribes fighting against each other with all, you know, the, sen the tribal sentiment in this competition. Of course, they are brothers. They, they lo love each other. They know they are brothers, but at the same time, they cannot stop this competition between each other. We have this happening all the time, uh, taking different shapes and trends from time to time. Now it's the competition, like uh, five years ago, the competition was over Egypt. Uh, yeah. Now the competition is over the axis of Turkey and maybe Afghanistan. And by the way, speaking about Afghanistan, like in the past two months, we have seen a very interesting also dynamic of this relationship between the United Arab Emirates and Qatar regarding Afghanistan. Qatar is uh, with Turkey are trying to uh, find a way to uh, manage the cable, uh, Kabul airport uh, mm -hmm. so they can have a similar power to what we had before the US withdrawal. Uh, the United Arab Emirates at the same time started to negotiate with Afghanistan uh, leaders, uh, with Taliban and uh, uh, other uh, influential leaders in, in there about taking care of the Kabul airport. And they are pressuring also on that. So we are very soon, we are going to see even this competition meeting in mm -hmm. Afghanistan between Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. But actually all this competition is now being balanced in a very, very smart way by the Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. Actually, I know I know many people in the West don't like him or, you know, but... It's but not about not... liking, though. They, they should still be able to look at geopolitical moves regarding what they think of any particular personality and look yeah. what is actually being done because geopolitics is separate from all these campaigns, in my opinion, and you should be able to see what is Saudi Arabia doing in relationship to these competitions. Can it preserve the GCC alliance or yes. will it be disrupted? No, I think the effort is exerted by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in the past uh, few months to balance this competition and ambition that is uh, that somehow blinding Qatar and United Arab Emirates to in, in, in you know moving the region, although it's serving the region in somehow because of course like advancing the region, competition is always a good thing. So Saudi Arabia with all its weight and size is now inter intervening in a very smart way as the big sister of the region, you know, to balance this competition. And I think it's very important to keep the GCC intact, keep it as a one whole. Uh, this is not only good for, uh, for, for the benefit of the GCC countries, uh, Gulf countries, but also for the entire region. And I'm sure the role that the Gulf uh, countries played in balancing the messy situations that we have seen after the Arab Spring in the past 10 years uh, is a good evidence on this. Like the GCC must remain stable, must remain one whole. And this is the role of Saudi Arabia now. This is the role that Saudi Arabia should be playing and Saudi Arabia is already playing. Uh, now, now I have a follow-up question to that because some would express skepticism. On the one hand, Saudi Arabia is integrating with Qatar economically on many levels. Qatar is getting involved in a number of internal domestic projects that, that is not even being widely discussed in the US from NIAM to various entertainment projects to you know, financial or banking institutions, so forth. On the other hand, we have seen in the past year the reports of UAE Saudi economic rivalry um, mm. become significant enough to warrant a number of high level discussions from the leaders of these countries and to make headlines and um, offer all sorts of financial analysis and speculation, including the fact that Saudi Arabia is seeking to attract firms out of UAE and have them moved to Saudi Arabia 
requiring companies looking to headquarter in the region to to headquarter in uh, in Saudi Arabia if they want to uh, do business there and so forth. How is this balancing act between the rivalry between Qatar and UAE going to play out if UAE and Saudi Arabia are having their own economic issues? And again, I'm separating this from political alliances. I'm focusing entirely on financial economic benefit. But, but if UAE and Qatar are still at odds over economic issues their competitors and Saudi Arabia and UAE are increasingly competitors and Saudi Arabia wants to create a balance between two states but is seeming to be growing closer to one state rather than the other how is that going to work out exactly yes uh, also very good question again uh, the point here is that we have to look at the base for or the main reason why there is a competition between saudi arabia and united arab emirates it's not similar to the you know tribal rivalry between qatar and the united arab emirates no everyone respects saudi arabia i mean in the gulf region and looks at it as a big sister mm -hmm. but the recent competition happened because Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and I think most of the other Arab Gulf countries are thinking that they have to, sh or they should now start opening up their economy. So they, they won't continue as oil dependent uh, economies anymore. They want to attract mm -hmm. new investments to the region, attract new investors. That's why we are seeing Saudi Arabia today are, opening in a way that no one ever expected empowering women uh, uh, hosting uh, parties you know this, imagine this is happening in saudi arabia this this was not uh, ever uh, like this is unthinkable of our region you know uh, or, or or of our time that saudi arabia is able to do this now so what's happening is that it's I wouldn't call it an economic competition between United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, but just this desire that we have to open up to other investors. Mm -hmm. There is a limited number of those investors. So they compete over who to attract them more. So mm -hmm. United Arab Emirates is offering more investment in incentives. And also Saudi Arabia now is, uh, uh, is making this uh, 2030 vision. Uh, to attract also uh, uh, those investors and provide them with incentives to invest in Saudi Arabia. But the problem is that Saudi Arabia have some infrastructure issues that it has to work on first that the United Arab Emirates has already solved and mm -hmm. has already done. So I think, let's say in, in the coming uh, five years or 10 years, the United Arab Emirates will remain more attractive to investors but this should not make Saudi Arabia stop uh, trying, stop planning for its vision, because after that or after this period of time, I'm sure Saudi Arabia will be a great place for investors from all over the world to come to. Now, given the situation, Qatar no doubt sees an opportunity to assist Saudi Arabia with these infrastructural issues, and in that in that sense, is looking for his for its own advantage because if it gets involved in those projects it will have greater regional role greater influence within saudi arabia and with it, given its rivalry with the uae and saudi rivalry with uae over in the same investors will actually be assisting saudi arabia in attracting those investors at the cost to uae mm. that seems to be actually causing <laughs> additional yeah. e economic frictions on some level indirectly and that i think is a one big chunk of current um of uh, of current uh, um strategy that is being missed by i think the general commentators who are excessively focused on personalities of various leaders and are not focused sufficiently on seeing on the on these tectonic economic changes taking place within the gcc which in my opinion are far more important but uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know, one factor for this is because actually decision making in these countries depends very much on the persons, on, on mm -hmm. the person who is making the decision more than, you know, all, all the other factors uh, governing uh, the issue. But actually, where this is leading us, I can see that Qatar is growing more reliant on or more closer to Saudi Arabia. 
than uh, before, and also growing more closer to Egypt, which means perhaps, and, and it already has a good relationship with uh, Turkey. So perhaps uh, in the near future, future, we will see a new coalition different from the one we have seen in the past five years between uh, Egypt uh, and Bahrain, wherein we will see Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Turkey making a new uh, coalition of their own, a new axis of their own that is, you know, uh, will lead the region in the next year, let's say. Now, you just underscored a very important point. You mentioned the importance of particular personalities uh, in, the, in their own countries for the, for, the, for the image of those countries, for the, for the support of various policies, and of course, the type of governance that they conduct. Now, President Erdogan of Turkey, we know what types of people he's grown close to during his time in office. We also know Amir Tamim's proclivities and the types of people he supports. You just mentioned the importance of the current Prince Mohammed bin Salman in his own country and the efforts that Saudi Arabia has taken to drive away Muslim Brotherhood extremists of various sorts and also to fight economic corruption, which we see prevalent in both Turkey, which in part led to current economic situation, leaving aside all the geopolitical and security repercussions. And we are seeing that Qatar continues to support financial and Muslim Brotherhood in Europe, another form of corruption. Given your mention of the importance of the personalities of these individuals, and given the recent visits by various leaders to each other for various, you know, within GCC there's, and, and Turkey, there's been uh scrambling diplomatic appearance how much of all of this is really about making real long-term progress and how much is about creating the appearance of unity between leaders who otherwise have on some of us very little in common and have very distinct personal preferences that we have seen um are much more likely to create divisions than any long-term alliances between that particular combination of people. I'm not talking about the countries in the long term, but those specific people while they're where they are. Yes. So if you if you look at the Muslim Brotherhood right now, or let me let me start the other way around. I will start by looking at uh, why, for example, Turkey and Qatar are supporting to the Muslim Brotherhood. By the way, it's not the same reason. For, Tur for Turkey, it's more ideological reason. Uh, President Erdogan himself is a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, the international organization of the Muslim Brotherhood. He's an Islamist and uh, he does not hide this. So of course he's supportive of the Muslim Brotherhood for ideological reasons. On the other hand, Qatar, I don't know, for some reasons they like to play with the bad people all the time. They like to, like, for example, they are playing with Taliban. They are playing with the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, every group that is calling itself, not, not just calling itself Islamists, but going against, uh, against or causing trouble in the region, you will find Qatar behind them. I think this is somehow the tool Qatar is, Qatar does not have a strong military and does not have, you know, uh, a way to defend itself or in the middle of this huge region we're living in. So I think that is Qatar's way of saying that I exist, I am here. I can, I can defend myself. I have, I can cause you trouble. I can affect your lives. I can change your regimes and so on by using these tools in the region. Now let's look at the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood themselves are already falling right now. Uh, there are a lot of divisions, I would say vertical divisions between the leaders happening now, those who are in London and those who are in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Istanbul, to the extent that we are now seeing two leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood group for the first time in history, two leaders. And uh, they are competing against each other. Also, there is a horizontal division happening between the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood and the youth the youth of the Muslim Brotherhood who lost the trust in the leadership because you know they left them behind, they are now competing against each other. So the Muslim Brotherhood is losing its base, support its, uh, uh, its grassroots bases, I would say, losing the youth and getting weaker day by day. 
So it's not anymore that attractive to Qatar to invest in or that attractive for Turkey to continue supporting, especially if this will cause Turkey, for example, to lose uh, important, or Qatar to lose important uh, relationships with neighbors in the region, like Egypt, United Arab Emirates, or Saudi Arabia. So I think sooner or later, Turkey and Qatar will quit supporting uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, politically, but they will not stop financing them so they keep the group alive. So in the future, whenever they need them, they will use them. So same thing, for example, Qatar has done with Taliban. Even when Taliban was quite weak under when the United States was inside uh, Afghanistan, Qatar continued to support Taliban. And they are supporting, uh, they, they now are, are you know, getting the reward for this support by being the most influential person in the region where you know, the United States is, is seeking to cooperate with to influence what's happening in Afghanistan. So, so somehow Qatar you know, has, has this policy of like playing with the bad people. Uh, Turkey has paid a very high price for its support to the Muslim Brotherhood. I don't think it will continue to do so. And we have already seen some decisions happening in Turkey uh, or being taken uh, uh, by the Turkish leadership to that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, elements who are living there should stop all their activities and especially the media activities attacking Egypt and other Arab countries. So many of them have already left, uh, many of the members of the Muslim Brotherhood have already left uh, Turkey. But of course, Turkey will not stop supporting this uh, ideology of political Islamism or, you know, the Khalifa system that should prevail the region. And so, because it's also part of their nationalist ideology. So, uh, but, but, but in general, I don't see a future for Islamism in the region. It's, it's like sooner or later, it will fade away. So what I'm seeing is the trend for the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, they're kind of basically outlook their usefulness for the time being. Turkey is trying to kind of reach some sort of understanding with the Egypt, with Egypt, and for, at the very least, it's paramount for them to to, uh, to exercise control over these people. But what you know, there may be on the rise another faction of the Muslim Brotherhood, and one thing they they exceptionally good at is having these different factions. When one is on, you know. Uh, it's not a solid body, it has its different chapters, there's some central coordination, but there is also great deal of uh, independence. Do you see the Yemeni Muslim Brotherhood as gaining some level of dominance where the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood is at the very least for the time being de de defanged, so to speak? Yes, somehow, you know, I, I, I don't have much experience on Yemen, actually, given you know, like all the complications uh, there. Mm -hmm. But somehow, yes, uh, they are, uh, they are gaining, we have seen gaining leverage in, uh, in the past, uh, uh, in the past period against the Houthis. And uh, also because the people are very tired of the Houthi and what they are doing. Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia wants to find a power inside Yemen that they can employ against the Houthi to, you know, uh, somehow control the evils they are sending to Saudi Arabia or get them busy with their internal conflict is rather than focusing on attacking Saudi Arabia. So all these factors are somehow uh, serving uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in, uh, in Yemen, unfortunately, yes. Meanwhile, you mentioned that Qatar has improved its relations with uh, uh, Egypt and is economically becoming more of a, more of a uh, influence there. You've, uh, one particular thing you, uh, I saw you mentioned was the Shell companies, the Dutch com uh, uh, energy giants, a transfer of its shares uh, that essentially benefits uh, Qatar and has allowed Qatar to invest for the first time in Egyptian oil market. It wasn't a huge chunk of shares, but it was a step. Can you uh, elaborate about this development? Because I think it's fascinating and Yes, oh. it is. It is actually. It's uh, It's also surprising. Like the same way, uh, you know, Turkey UAE rapprochement is surprising. I think Qatar Egypt rapprochement also 
is very, very surprising, given the fact that we are having now, let's say, 11 months since uh, the signing of uh, the Gulf Reconciliation Agreement in January. And within these 11 months, we have seen the relationship between Qatar and Egypt evolving in a tremendous way from like complete animosity to complete friendship and cooperation, not only on bi bilateral issues, but also on regional issues. Like, for example, now Qatar and Egypt are working together on the project to reconstruct uh, the Gaza Strip and uh, to provide humanitarian aid to the Palestinian people in Gaza and so on. So this was something that we couldn't even think of, uh, let's say, 10 months ago. So this is good. Also, on a very important development that happened last week, uh, Qatar started to make actual direct investments in the energy sector in Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, they bought 17% uh, uh, from Shell Company in the Red Sea oil uh, blocks, uh, oil and natural gas blocks uh, of Egypt in the Red Sea. And this investment, it's, it's a big investment compared to the fact that this is the first time Qatar make a direct investment in the Egyptian energy sector. The, uh, many people are confused about this, by, so, by the way, because in the past, Qatar had some investments in the oil sector in Egypt, but not direct investments. In other words, Qatar is uh, an one of the big investors, the giant investors, actually in the Arab refining company. The Arab refining company is the one that implemented these pro uh, one uh, important project between 2012 and 2019. That uh, uh, in this this project, it was uh, a project in northern Cairo to build an oil refinery system. Uh, Qatar was one of the investors in this project. So people think that, no, this is not the first time they invested in Egypt before, but no, this is a very direct investment Qatar Energy makes in Egypt, which I think a huge uh, step in the relationship between Egypt and Qatar, and also have, has you know, a, a geopolitical dimension because we are speaking about the Red Sea. And mm -hmm. the Red Sea means Suez Canal, means uh, it's, it's much more than, uh, means Israel, means uh, even uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. It's, it's a very complicated region for Qatar to exist there and have this influence there. It's, uh, it's, it's like interesting to watch how this is going to develop uh, next. What I am seeing is potentially Qatar looking to make its uh, geopolitical position between, between, you know, the Abraham Accords on the one hand, the East Med Gas Forum on the other hand, they're looking to make their own presence. For those who haven't been watching Qatar's energy strategy, they've withdrawn from OPEC claiming that they're looking to focus on the NL LNG development, which is their big market, you know, energy kind of sup uh, superiority, but um, at the same time, they've been very actively pursuing an, an oil-related strategy in the Horn of Africa, consolidating kind of purchases of oil blocks in Kenya and other places. Can you comment a little bit about this? Because for many people, it may seem confusing since they left OPEC and people kind of lost track of what they were doing in that regard. Yes, Qatar is, is very active in this region, that's true. And they are, uh, of course, not only investing in LNG, but also in, in oil and uh, uh, raw gas. Uh, I don't know it's, uh, what the term is, but uh, they, they have a lot of investments in the energy sector in this uh, uh, part. And as you said, of course, they are trying to balance uh, what's happening in the Mediterranean and the rise of the East, uh, uh, the East made the gas organization and all also the discoveries that are uh, now being made by Egypt. Uh, either in the Mediterranean or in uh, the Red Sea. So Qatar is getting very active in these regions. And actually also another dimension to add to this is uh, that Turkey at the same time is growing more dependent on Egypt uh, in uh, getting its, uh, its uh, gas supply, natural gas supply. We have seen in the, in the last three months alone, like a very short period of time, Egypt sent seven cargoes of natural gas to Turkey 
through the, the Mediterranean, which also uh, very important. And if the cooperation was successful between Qatar and Egypt in uh, the Red Sea uh, oil fields, I think sooner or later Qatar will try also to invest in the East uh, Med or the Mediterranean region through uh, the Egyptian uh, blocks and fields to which eventually will serve Turkey and other countries that are allies with, uh, with Qatar. So we are seeing a very interesting trajectory. On the one hand, we have easy complete chaos in Ethiopia, which was an imp the Ethiopian government was a very important ally for both uh, Turkey and Qatar, but now it's, you know, there's a civil war there. Uh, there is other countries where Turkey and Qatar were both uh, influential. Somalia is one of them. Mm -hmm. Egypt has tried to make a diplomatic um, uh, inquiries there as well. Uh, we are seeing Red Sea kind of enter, you know, from Yemen, you can see the trajectory from Yemen, where is, there's, you know, also significant oil and gas deposits in the south, all the way up to the Horn of Africa, and beyond mm -hmm. that, and you are seeing, you know, Qatar had normalized with Yemen after the Lula agreement with the GCC states in Egypt, and, you know, Turkey has had some presence in parts of uh, Yemen, mostly kind of military, but uh, it has had its own interest with the Muslim Brotherhood Party vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Houthis, but um, both countries are looking to play a role, particularly in both energy and security fields there. So you can see this trajectory from Yemen through the Red Sea with the oil and gas deposit the East Med and all the way to the east of Africa. And I'm, I'm kind of curious how that is going to work out in terms of regional security and the other existing alliances. The, East Med Gas Forum consists of a number of countries such as Greece and Cyprus ha that have significant issues with Turkey and don't trust Qatar even if they have to deal with them. And uh, so, you know, Qatar is clearly looking to make it to establish some sort of a presence. How is that going to affect those relationships? And uh, you mentioned that it could be a problem for deepening relationships with Turkey for UAE. UAE is part of a strong growing alliance with France, Greece, and Cyprus. Uh, defense relations as well. What, what, what's the big picture here? I think uh, no sooner or later uh, the, the Turkey will will you know I mean Turkey is looking at the United Arab Emirates as only as an investor right now. So I think sooner or later this relationship will be broken. But. Mm -hmm. On, on another level, Tur Turkey is expanding in Africa in an unprecedented way, in a very dangerous way, I would say. Mm -hmm. And this expansion is not only economic, but also military. And they, uh, as we have seen in Ethiopia, for example, they started to provide them with weapons to use against the people of Tigray, uh, including advanced drones, uh, which, which is... Uh, very new to Africa in general. Uh, also, we have seen last week uh, President Erdogan was having this uh, big uh, conference with uh, the summit, the uh, Turkey Africa summit, which uh, ironically he did not invite the Egypt. You know, I mean, Egypt is the chair of Comessa. And despite that, uh, it, it was not invited, which was somehow strange. But the key here is that, okay, Qatar and Turkey, of course, will try to have an influence in Africa because it will balance uh, the influence that uh, the United Arab Emirates is having in the Mediterranean and also the influence Saudi Arabia is having in Africa. So they will try to balance this. But the point here is that they cannot do this without Egypt. And they have to understand that they have to cooperate with Egypt on this. Right now, Egypt is somehow open of course, with a lot of caution to cooperation with Qatar and Turkey. Uh, with Turkey, things are even more slow, by the way. It's uh, still not, not you know, uh, mm -hmm. progressing in the way that we want it to be. But it's very slow. And I think the main reason for this is, um, you know, the personal prejudices of, uh, of some leaders. So I think it's uh, as soon as Turkey and Qatar are becoming able to effectively cooperate, to fruitfully cooperate on deeper diplomatic and political level, similar to what we are seeing between Egypt and Qatar right now. Unless this moment, 
no real influence of Turkey into Africa or Qatar into Africa is going to happen. Yes, they will continue like, you know, to providing them with weapons, trying to affect the economy or so, but without no real influence or control over uh, this continent or East Africa, let's say in particular, because this is the region that most, most people are interested in uh, or most, uh, most uh, competitors of the region are interested in. So unless Egypt is involved, it will be very difficult for them to have any influence in uh, this area. That's why they will continue you know, courting Egypt for a while uh, in, in the next, uh, in the ne next period? Uh, I mean, Egypt, as I see it, is in a very strategic position to essentially become a kind of inter-regional uh, police, policeman or broker be between uh, East Med, Red Sea uh, area and the strategic uh, littorals there and uh, the Horn of Africa. But there are multiple different kind of alliances and attempted um, influences coming to that point. How do you see that happening? I mean, at the same time, Egypt is still trying to deal with multiple internal problems with its, to grow its own economy, to deal with, you know, development and, and so forth. How, how well positioned do you think Egypt for dealing with these multiple things that are coming, you know, whether anyone is noting it or not, to kind of coming to a head in that particular intersection of uh, international maritime trade and uh, and you know security issues mm, i think egypt learned the lesson uh, the hard way in the past few years that it has to balance relations with everyone in the region the good people and the bad people uh, we have seen, for example, uh, toward the end of last year, Egypt started to uh, communicate with all the parties in Libya, including the parties that in the past it did not want to communicate with because of their uh, affiliation with Turkey, Turkey and so. Uh, uh, also in March, it started to communicate with Turkey and take effective measures to balance its relationship with, again, its, its relationship with Cyprus uh, and uh, Greece which are their you know, rivalry and animosity, historical animosity with Turkey. At the same time, uh, started to balance its relationship with Qatar, still keeping good relationship with the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. But in my opinion, I think the main, uh, the main ally that Egypt needs in, in to have this influence that we are aspiring and to balance its central strategic position and keep this central strategic position on all sides is Saudi Arabia. I mm -hmm. think Saudi Arabia is the most important ally for Egypt in the next phase. Also, given the fact that Saudi Arabia is already playing a role in establishing itself as again, or not establishing, but regaining its position again as the leader of the Gulf region, which this, this position somehow, you know, retreated a little bit in the past few years. But now Saudi Arabia is returning and saying, yes, I am the leader of this region and Egypt as, you know, for its historical importance in the region as well, and also strategic geopolitical position. I think if like the two countries are able to coordinate their work together, a lot of good things will happen to the region. I want to, to come back very quickly um, to the security aspect of some of these things and to a different angle uh, of that, uh, which is UAE's desire to become a hugely successful, well-defended country. And you mentioned F-35 and <laughs> we've seen oh, yeah. the buckle between the United States and uh, UAE over this issue, this uh, kind of unseemly back and forth that should have probably been resolved behind the scenes <laughs> and in, in a yes. somewhat more effective way. Now, one thing you noticed, you noted in the article, which I found very interesting, was that Israel to some extent was opposed to F-35's sale to UAE. One, one presume, uh, presumed concern being the maintenance of military superiority in the region. Now, this raises a whole host of questions. How was this not addressed during the Abraham Accords talks, given that it was literally one of the conditions for the signing of the agreement? <laughs> and yeah. all of a sudden, there's a, there's a, it seems to be a conflict over that, if that is the case. The other issue um, 
you know, Qatar has been trying to gain access to the very same plane, was denied again over, in part, over Israel's objections. And uh, one of the other concerns is both countries, UAE and Qatar's relationship with Iran. And uh, mm. that, that was supposed to be a concern. But the other uh, aspect is that both countries seem to be buying weapons from Turkey as well. And I, I'm, I'm starting to wonder whether or not perhaps there is more to it than simply defense concerns and rather economic con competition between Israel's and Turkey's defense sectors. Between Israel and Turkey defense sectors. Oh, wow. OK, OK. Because so, this is uh, the one, uh, one issue that no one's been talking about at all. But I think it's yes. a very legitimate question, especially in the areas of drone production, but also jet planes and, and, and basically air, air power. Yes, yes, that's that's very interesting and eye opening question, by the way, uh, because, well, when we speak about, uh, first of all, Iran in this equation, mm -hmm. Qatar is already an ally with Iran for a long mm -hmm. time. And, and we know that now the United Arab Emirates is trying to play a similar role with Iran, it's trying to, uh, you know, abuse Iran when uh, make make, you know, things happy between each other and establish a new relationship the same way it has been trying to do with Turkey. And even Iran is more important to uh, the United Arab Emirates more than uh, Turkey because of the geographic proximity and also uh, sharing the same Gulf, the, the very, very geographically close. And there is also a lot of trade uh, relationship between the two countries. So I think, uh, yes, the United Arab Emirates is, is trying to win this, but at the same time, it is trying to keep good relationships with Israel to get the F-35 from, uh, from the United States, at least Qatar, when it asked it for the F-35, it knows that its, it's, it's uh, request will be rejected because of its relationship with Qatar and Turkey and other uh, um, key players in the region, and also for its support for Islamist Taliban and so on. There are a lot of complications with this. But for the United Arab Emirates, I think after signing the Abraham Accords, they did not expect that from the United States. They expected, like, as soon as they ask for the F-35, they will get it because they now are muting uh, the talk about the threat that they may represent to Israel because now they are friends with Israel, normali normalizing relations and having good relationships with them. And so, and even in the Israeli media, we have seen people saying that, uh, okay, we don't see uh, United Arab Emirates as an enemy anymore. So we don't need to keep this uh, uh, superiority against uh, or military superiority against the United Arab Emirates. But if we look at what's really happening on the ground, no, the United States is, I mean, the, this superiority is not only important for, uh, for Israel, but also important for the United States itself. Like it's a matter that the United States cares for more than Israel cares for for itself. Because Israel remains, يعني, with all due respect to the other parties, Israel remains the strongest ally of the United States in the region, the mm -hmm. most important ally in the region. Uh, if a war happens, the first country, the United States will, will like get in and uh, make bases and fight from will be Israel, not any other Arab country. So, so of course, given this fact, the keeping the superiority of Israel is very important also uh, as, as we have seen uh, this growing relationship between Gulf countries and Iran and Turkey is also disturbing if you look at it, at it from the point of view of the, the US administration. But what we are seeing now is that the United Arab Emirates is trying to, you know, reverse this equation a little bit by saying that, okay, you don't want to give us F-35 fighters we don't want them we will go to other uh, options like france for example and sign a deal a huge deal to buy 80 rafales 80 80 that's a huge number with... now that particular deal has been in negotiations for 10 years and has precedes the you know the debacle with this with this administration over f-35 just to give a bit of context but yes it does also send a message that UAE has partnership, effective 
defense trade partnerships with other countries. Exactly. Like, you know, we are ready to choose other people. Also, when we look at the at the negotiations or the defense uh, security leaders who are or the defense leaders who are uh, uh, the United the Emirati defense delegations that travel to Turkey to discuss uh, defense cooperation is also another message that okay you don't want to give Turkey or UAE the F-35 we will find a way to do it together especially that uh, Turkey in the past uh, few months started to mention that it started to achieve self sufficiency from uh, uh, in its uh, defense industry. So it's, uh, it's also, I don't know, I think this uh, makes, I should make the United States rethink uh, its involvement in the armament uh, issues in the region, especially that we are living at a time now when armament trace in the region is reaching, you know, insane levels, literally. Everyone is buying armies from everywhere. And that, that raises a question, can UAE balance its relationships with all these parties? For instance, my sense from that uh, is that some Israeli companies are maybe confused as to why UAE bought so many weapons from Turkey, but not from Israel, while they are also buying French weapons and so forth. And they may see it as a signal that perhaps UAE is reevaluating its role in the Abraham Accords, not in terms of tearing up the agreement, but in terms of shifting to closer alliances with Turkey, Iran, and other parties they see as having more global defense reach at the moment when the US is kind of out of the region and is not, and is basically backing Iran very strongly on many things and so forth. Do you, no. do you believe there could be a kind of a diplomatic or political tension as a result of? these all these factors coming together oh no i don't think it will get to this point of of diplomatic tension and also i don't think uh, the united arab emirates uh, wants us to uh, reevaluate mm -hmm. its position on the abraham accords no i think they are liking the mm -hmm. idea that you know they are having peace with israel and also actually it has become inevitable that everyone in the region should have peace with each other and have peace with israel of course i mean Otherwise, we will be wasting our time, you know, or just speaking emotional things, sure. not, not pragmatic, real actions that should happen. So the United Arab Emirates understands that, and but but you know there is a pattern uh, in usually in how the United Arab Emirates build its relationships. Usually, you know, it's a, you know the term uh, blowing hot and cold. Mm -hmm. This is the United Arab Emirates. They start very hot, very warm, very, you know, very loving. And you'll find it all over the media, as they have done with Egypt and what they are now doing with Turkey. But a few months later, you know, the curve goes down and things cool down and they leave you confused, like what happened? We were very close. What happened? You know, so this is what the United Arab Emirates do. Not, not with bad intentions, but this is their pattern of sure. building relationships in the region. They did it with Egypt, doing with Turkey, did it with Israel and every other one in the region. So I think uh, Israel should not be confused in, in this part. But the important question you ask it about, can the United Arab Emirates purchase weapons from Israel? That's, uh, that's, uh, that would be interesting to see happening, but I don't think it's going to happen because again, there is a factor that the mm -hmm. US factor in the issue, like mm -hmm. the US is behind Israel already or behind the, like when we speak about the Israeli military, we always think of the American military behind but it. US just uh, re refused to expedite the delivery of, of certain uh, defensive weapons to Israel, which of course also raises questions in Israel's mind about this current administration's commitments oh. in light of other in light of other things. So that that throws yet another wrench into this whole in, equa dynamic, you know. Yeah, yeah, that, that's also a good point, actually. Yes, but but you know, but I don't I don't see like also the relationship between UAE and Israel will get to the defense point at this moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think first they are like now building diplomatic relations. Maybe we'll sure. start to see economic cooperation happening soon. And then then after that, um, after a few years or so, we will start to see maybe cooperation in the sector of defense. 
Now, this is a very well, good point that you raised, and to me, it seems completely reasonable and realistic. But the previous, the Trump administration was pushing um, all these deals, peace deals, the Abraham Accord, Alula Agreement, and so forth, in an effort to create this regional um, Arab NATO Mesa uh, alliance vis a vis Iran. Now, the idea of integrating Arab states, eventually Israel and, and perhaps even Turkey to some extent into this uh, grouping against Iran, to me, always seemed somewhat implausible, a bit of a stretch. Yes. <laughs> but now it seems to be even less likely than ever before. To me, I'm trying, you know, uh, it sounds to me like Israel and UAE are not on, not yet at the stage where even they can 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 yes. be fully integrated, much less other countries that don't even have diplomatic relations with Israel, which makes it more difficult to do anything beyond some counterterrorism operations. Um, so that leads us to where is the kind of, you know, Iran is, yes, it's willing to trade with UAE, it's willing to do business with various uh, countries, but at the same time, it keeps pursuing its own strategy, regardless of its relations with everybody else. We've seen that diplomatic relations have never stopped anybody anywhere in any part of the world from waging war on another party with whom they may have diplomatic relations. They either, you know, cut the relations when they need to, or they just proceed regardless without, you know, through proxies and so forth. So where do we stand against these regional defense issues against common threats. Yes, everybody is pursuing this panic diplomacy, trying to kind of cut deals and minimize the chances for uh, encounters, military encounters. But really, what's, it doesn't sound like there's, there is a coherent alliance between anybody and, any, and anybody else, so, which is easy to exploit. What, 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 what do you think is going to happen in terms of that? Yes, that's true. And I would also add to this that the armament trade that's happening in the region now, most of it is about uh, purchasing or buying the armies, mm -hmm. but this is not accompanied by any uh, actual training or uh, improving the performance of personnel in the militaries of, of, the, of the region. Uh, except, of course, in, in certain militaries like Israel, Egypt, uh, Turkey, of course, you know, like the old and established militaries. But all the new military forces that we are seeing, uh, like acquiring uh, or procuring a lot of arms right now, mm -hmm. most of them are not, are not accompanied by building the individuals, building the real military, the human beings in the military. This is, mm -hmm. not, this is not happening which again tells us that maybe defense cooperation in terms with uh, actual defense cooperation, like, uh, like building actual defense relationship is not going to happen in the region if things continued that way. At the same time, Iran is actually getting more influential in the region through its proxy, uh, proxies that are spread almost everywhere now. Uh, starting from the Houthis in Yemen and uh, to, to especially in Iraq, they are almost controlling Iraq now. They are almost the de facto leaders of, of, of Iraq now. And we have seen what they have done after the elections and tried to turn the table against, uh, uh, against very democratic, or turn the table of this democratic elections that happened. So it's, uh, Iran is, is still very dangerous, still playing a very dangerous role, but who is standing against it? No one, no one. On the contrary, most of the people are trying to, or most of the countries are trying to win Iran, not including by the way, Saudi Arabia, which is mm -hmm. uh, the historical enemy of Iran, now is even opening up to, you know, maybe having conversation with Iran, trying to win it uh, as, as a, not, not as an ally, but at least, you know, to, to balance its relationship with, so to know that maybe they will not uh, be a source of danger to us anymore, you know. So I think this is a wrong strategy. Unfortunately, the United States too is also getting very tolerant with Iran in uh, the Biden administration, which is also very wrong. But at the same time, what could work against that, I think the only power in the region that can work or that can, you know, um, uh, make a difference in this equation is Turkey. And Turkey right now is 
an ally with Iran and Qatar. And uh, but you know, it's uh, actually Turkey is not really an ally with Iran. It's it depend it's depending in Iran for gas and uh, gas supplies and so on. What I'm hearing is that the current new economic minister in Turkey has ties to the IRGC directly. So that should mm. that should lend some level of understanding both on Turkey's economic priorities or strategy, or at least in terms of alliances, if not necessarily internal issue, and where where it sees itself going in the near future, at least. The fact that this new guy has those ties speaks to a potential you know, closer relationships between Iran and Turkey, at least on trade and economic issues, not not further kind of deterioration of some of the interests. And, uh, you know, again, uh, the trade route with the UAE may not be realistic, but I wonder if some other level of economic trilateral engagement is going to be a priority given the appointment of this particular individual. Actually, um, it's uh, it's news to me to know mm-hmm. that he's he's having uh, ties with uh, with Iran or having links to Iran, but that's that's very interesting. And even without him, actually, Turkey is depending very badly on Iran mm-hmm. for many reasons. But we have seen uh, an episode of almost a war between Turkey and Iran in Iraq. Uh, I think in the past summer, when uh, when uh, the Turkish forces was fighting against the PKK and uh, uh, other other uh, other uh, militia there, and uh, the Iranian militia inside Iraq like stood up against them, yeah. and they said no problem, and they said uh, they have to uh, they ha- like they asked them to uh, get out of the country or otherwise they will do harm to the Turkish soldiers and so, and so. Uh, Iran is having a leverage in this because uh, Ir- Iran is is fighting with proxies, but Turkey is fighting with its own personnel. So the the cost of war for Turkey here is very high. That's why Turkey, like you know, had had to accept what Iran is saying. So this tells us that actually Iran is more influential in the region than Turkey. It's not the other way around. And this is, uh, and also given its relationship with, Af- with, uh, with uh, Qatar and its influence on Afghanistan, all these factors, you know, make, make Iran, unfortunately, uh, a very dangerous power in the region that every party, including regional powers and even the United States should be more, uh, what is the word like more decisive in dealing with it rather than you know negotiations and again once uh, once and again that does not lead to any actual uh, or even sanctions and so that does not lead to any actual uh, pressure on Iran. No, there's increasingly experts claiming that economic and sanction economic and trade relationships and uh, you know pressure on dictatorial authoritarian states do not really work and certainly not in today's very complicated landscape we are not in a cold war actually rather than having more polarization we are having more integration between various actors and parties affiliated with uh, bigger and mid-level powers that that uh, you know make it more difficult to disentangle these interests and more difficult for the US or anybody, any, indivi- indi- any individual country in particular to gain clear allies against or for any particular um, other issue. To be honest, I think even if Biden would decided to completely reevaluate its entire regional strategy, uh, it would have a great deal of, a very hard time doing so given, given these new relationships and everyone's desire to not be dependent either on the US or on each other or and pursuing their own individual kind of relationships and trying to limit influences of other actors. I don't really see how how that new strategy is going to would even start to work out. And I think that's only going to lead people to not want to engage anymore if something is perceived as too complicated, they don't even want to delve into it and things will get even 
more tangled up, uh, uh, you know, with, with time, if this current trajectory continues. Alternatively, some of these relationships simply will not work out. They're temporary. Um, the actors will gain what they want. There will be internal power struggles of various factions over policy issues. And mm -hmm. one party will eventually prevail, even if it takes some time. And a, clear, a more clear course of action will be defined. That's another possibility. But it's not at this point, it's not clear which one mm -hmm. is going to be. I think it's going to be to take a long time to for those to resolve itself. I don't really see though I see I see a potential for pluralistic alliances based on issue by issue. Gas, the gas forum, you know, oil related issues, security uh, trajectories based on specific regional interests, but I don't really um it, it's not clear how some of these conflicting interests are going to balance each other out. Um, mm. As you've pointed out in your article, okay, Egypt is trying to balance its issues with everybody, but, but it's easy for Egypt. Egypt is a big country strategically located and kind of has to, and everyone understands that it has to. But UAE trying to balance its relationship with Turkey and Greece, that's going to be very awkward. I mean, I'm, I kind of want it's, to yeah, just, uh, what, what in your opinion will UAE ultimately prioritize given the current trajectory? You know, actually, the, maybe the good news in all this chaos that's happening in the diplomatic relations in the region right now is that the Middle East countries are growing more pragmatic than emotional. Mm -hmm. We uh, forever they have been emotional, and you have even seen that like the causes they adopted are always emotional. The conflicts between each other has always been based on uh, emotional uh, basis, but now they are growing more pragmatic. That's why we are seeing them making coalitions that seem strange to us. Mm -hmm. Of course, the challenge of the United Arab Emirates balancing relationships with Turkey and uh, and Greece and Cyprus and also its position in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, Gas Forum as an observer. All these factors are, I think, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, the United Arab Emirates is getting too ambitious in a very dangerous way, I would say. Sometimes it's blinded by this ambition and they are playing to play a role that is bigger than or like stretching themselves you know on mm -hmm. on many on many fronts without really having a clear vision on what they want to go and this is the main problem maybe many countries in the region are are suffering from okay we know that we should make coalitions we should fix relationships with our rival rivals or enemies or opponents i would say very quickly but why and where this is going to take us no clear answer to this so until this like the same challenge by the way that that is on the united arab emirates now in balancing its relationship between turkey and uh, and greece is also mm -hmm. happening with egypt you know egypt mm -hmm. too is having a challenge to balance its relationship with uh, this front of greece and uh, uh, Cyprus, Israel, United Arab Emirates, with its now evolving relationship with Turkey, Qatar, and even Pakistan, you know, it's, it's very difficult. But eventually, I think, uh, again, as, a, as I mentioned, it, it, it will end up with having like four main uh, links that will lead the region. They will be Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and maybe Pakistan will, will mm -hmm. get uh, in on this axis. Uh, sorry, and Turkey, of course. And Pakistan will join, definitely. As Turkey joins, Pakistan joins automatically. So mm -hmm. I think this axis will be the one leading the region from now on. The United Arab Emirates will continue with its ambitions, uh, will continue, by the way, to separate itself from the region so it appears as unique. We have even seen this happening with uh, changing the weekend. You know, for the first, the first country, the first Arab country to make its week and uh, uh, Saturday and Sunday, which, which by the way, will put a lot of difficulty for the people who want to make the Friday prayers. 
in, mm -hmm. in the United States, but you know, they wanted to, to do this so they be more, appear more, you know, non Middle Eastern. Like, you mm -hmm. know, we are not part of this, we are bigger than this, we have traveled to Mars. So mm -hmm. we can we are better than our context. I think this is the sentiment that the United Arab Emirates is is uh, is having. That's why it will continue to separate itself from the region. It will be very successful in this, by the way, and I'm sure it will have a lot of uh, economic. Will, will continue with its economic and and uh, political successes. It will not stop. This will not weaken us. I mean, separating itself from the region will not weaken uh, the United Arab Emirates. On the co on the contrary, it will. Make Make it stronger but at the same time if we are speaking about on the regional level no the new leaders of the region uh will be this this axis i told you about turkey uh -huh. egypt saudi arabia and qatar and of course pakistan if we will go further this way so do you think in the long term it kind of makes sense for these countries to focus less on the region itself given that uae is doing so well without it uh, uh, and just also focus on their own uh multilateral you know bilateral relationships with whoever rather than even looking at middle east as a kind of a place you know of or a, an alliance anymore beyond some bilateral economic you know projects yeah so so the um, first is the eastern mediterranean uh, uh playground will not continue to be the favorite favorite playground for the united arab emirates for long Mm -hmm. It will remain there for a while until it finds out that it can't really have good relationships with Turkey as it wants to, or it can uh, keep even relationship with Greece and Cyprus as good as they have been in the past uh, year or so. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the United Arab Emirates realize this, it will start to open uh, new places for itself. I think the next playground for the United Arab Emirates will be Africa, for sure. Mm -hmm. It's now making huge investments in Africa and increasing even its uh, strategic and uh, uh, defense relationships with uh, with uh, important African countries, uh, especially in the uh, east of Africa. And uh, so we will see a lot of activity for the UAE in, in this place soon. On the other hand, uh, I think Saudi Arabia will uh, be very important in, uh, in balancing this uh, these movements by the United Arab Emirates uh, in different places, while also sooner or later Saudi Arabia will be a good place uh, to attracting investments, which which uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure this also will change the whole dynamic in the region once again in ten years from now or so. So uh, and we may also see new coalitions being formed at that time. For Egypt, it has no other option other than balancing relationships with everyone. It has to do this. It's very difficult, very, very difficult, but it has to keep good relationships with everyone. Um, this sometimes may mean that some of the countries may misunderstand Egypt's position, but it has no other option. Otherwise, it, it will lose. It will lose a lot. Also, we have to wait and see what will happen in Libya. I think it will be a very important, um, uh, very important factor in deciding what will happen in uh, the North Africa region, which of course affects also the Middle sure. East and the Eastern Mediterranean. So we have to see what will happen in the Libyan elections, where it is going to lead, who is going to win, uh, whether a, a civil war is going to happen again inside Libya or not, uh, the role of the militia in Libya, terrorism in, in there, and also uh, especially uh, its linkage also to Chad, uh, Niger, and you know all the, mm -hmm. and the Horn of Africa, all the areas where there is already a lot of trouble happening. So we like we have to wait to see what's going to happen in Libya in the next months or so, and uh, hopefully from there Egypt will will start you know to to make the balances it need to make to continue with its past. But again, we should have a clear vision. Not not we I mean Egypt only, but the region should have a clear vision where it wants to go, where it wants. Uh, especially after the U.S. withdrawal from the region, which which means okay, the, the allies that we know is not here anymore. Everyone is seeking to make alliances with other parties, 
that sometimes are working against each other, like for example, with France and Turkey at the same time, with, uh, with uh, Russia and the China at the same time. So we, we need also to understand what type of coalitions we want to make, who is going to replace the United States, or can we convince the United States to come back again and be the main ally in the region or remain the main ally in the region, not to withdraw. It's a lot of, a lot of challenging things that are happening right now. And this is putting most of the countries in this state of panic until you know, things are get more stable again. No, the one the one issue I think all of the Middle Eastern and other states misunderstand is that they think Biden or Trump or whoever is in the White House that they're the cause of particular course of action in the US. To some extent they are because they're the president and they have the executive power to form foreign policy. But who ends up in in that position and what course they follow is very much tied to the uh to the domestic concerns and very much tied to the popular trends in the US. The trend uh, in, you know, people may not like what Biden is doing or how Trump conducted his policy, but at the same time, it's no doubt they were linked to popular views on, on US role in the world, which not, not, not something I necessarily agree with, but you can't form relations with the US the same way it was done 30, 40 years any, anymore by just working with the president and some members of the Congress and expect uh, to, for things to stay the same. Now, the US is in a place of polarization, of confusion. There's been a lot of isolationist rhetoric versus extreme interventionist rhetoric, not much education about foreign policy and US political tools in the universities or otherwise. So there is, uh, the US is operating in a very kind of simplified, outdated picture of the world where it's, it was, you know, either you, you know, you're at war with everyone or you're not dealing with anyone and you seem, and you'll still be okay. It's no longer true for the US either. So, uh, you know, my one advice to all these countries is to engage with people, with the voters with the decision makers beyond the political circle to try to understand even the think tanks are no longer what they used to be. They are more, they're more likely to be echo chambers for the for whoever is in power looking for access than, than advisors on foreign policy to the administrations or to Congress. So they are not necessarily influential as much as they reflect existing influence. So it's it's time to kind of reevaluate the strategy of engagement. If if these countries want to bring US back into a constructive regional and international law, uh, role, they need to figure out who who are the right people to get the right types of people in office. Very important, yes. And also this may be explain, you know, the complaints of many people in the region now that the US even does not have a clear vision of what it wants to do in the Middle East. No, and you can't have a vision if you have generations of people who've been, who have zero understanding of foreign policy or US or mm. appreciation for their US role in the world. These people are not going to be elect, electing visionary leaders. They're going to be electing leaders who just cater to what, to what is emotional and popular, which is not mm. always what's best for the country. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and uh, yeah. That's, that's, uh, why, that's why I earlier said it's not about liking you know, whoever is in Saudi Arabia, in UAE, in Egypt, you can't base your policy on your personal like of this or that. Can you have to look at their policy, their vision, and what they are doing, whether you like that person or not, or agree with everything that they do, it's irrelevant. You're not going, most people are never going to be friends with them. It's not about friendships. It's about whether a course of the country and whether those particular personalities can help you achieve your own goals and kind of manage the, the, the situation. And that's why I'm so concerned that so many decisions in the US have started being made on emotional, oh, we don't like that one. So we are not going to deal with that country. <laughs> and what does that mean for the entire region and for US economic relationships and for the US role? And all, oh, well, we just don't like that guy. I mean, exactly. It's exactly. not a and, serious conversation. <laughs> yeah, and also I think part of this confusion we've seen with the F-35 issues. 
yeah. with uh, with Turkey, with uh, Qatar, with UAE, with uh, yeah, they they don't know uh, whether to sell it or not to sell it. Even with Saudi Arabia, whether to uh, complete the armament deals with them or not to complete. No, you know? uh, first of all, how do you you know you make you make a deal with somebody, then you make a you, do, you nobody force you to uh, make a deal, but you have to abide by your pre-existing uh, commitments and not and then not make new ones if that's what you decide. This is not, you cannot be taken seriously if you breach your contracts. That's basically, you know, that's basically, it's not about whether you like UAE or you don't like, you like Saudi Arabia, exactly. whether you agree yeah. with their, you know, with their policy, you do not. You had a business arrangement. Your business arrangement means your credibility in the world. This is about you, it's not about them. That's, exactly, that's how would, exactly. I really how hope I really hope the U.S. administration understand this before it's think, uh, it's too late. I know. don't really think that they think about it that at all, already. and I don't think they whatever their own principles they don't they're not consistent in being guided even by them because you know if you don't want to sell to UAE then don't go run running back after them saying oh we'll sell you after all after they decided to withdraw. Just you know that's not not serious. Make clear your criteria on which you're going to sell. This is what needs to happen. This is what we're expecting. And this is the timeline for delivery if you decide if you agree exactly. to these conditions. That's it. It's a business. And, and be committed to it. That's right. Yeah. 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 That's uh, yeah. So this is this explains this confusion we're seeing in the region now. Yes. Yeah, yeah this is uh, the people in power are completely not rooted in any guiding understanding of how policies work, of how arrangements work, how law works, how uh, how business works, you know, the fact that every sphere, whether in trade, in economics and politics, it's guided by certain understandings. You may not like particular actors, don't deal with those particular actors, but if you are dealing with them, then be consistent in how you're dealing with them, you know? Exactly. That's that's the problem. When you have a group of people who are driven by ideological, emotional spheres mm -hmm. and have no understanding of, of how policy should be effectively implemented, but they come from academia with no real nothing really at stake for political me. experience yeah no political it's experience. about your personal personal feelings and not the interests of your country then you know it's not it's not a serious it's not you're not going to have serious understandable policy it's not going to be a policy it's going to be an emotional reaction to people you like or don't like <laughs> that's exactly. not how policy should work it's it's a very yes. dangerous course of action the way i see it. this is what the us has been complaining about the middle east and now it's replicating exactly, exactly. exactly. I, w I was going to say <laughs> this yeah you know we used to see this happening in the middle east all the time but now unfortunately it's uh, coming from the other way is other way you know yeah, these like, emotional other... considerations should stop during campaigns you like this candidate you like his platform you vote for him once he's in office you have to deal with whoever it is whether you like them or not you have to try to find a way to of working and getting Work your results them. exactly yeah. get your results out if you, there's nothing you agree with then work with congress try to pressure find a pragmatic way to get your results done but people yeah. are just thinking about who they like who you know it's about outrage and fear and like but, and love you you don't need to be married to this candidate you need to exactly. get your results <laughs> But also, you know, we're having an impression here that maybe the, the members of Congress who are supportive of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, you know, certain names, as you know, uh, are, are behind this confusion to, or playing some they role are, in this But at the same time, if you know an identifiable group of people who are very clearly operating on the basis of personal financial considerations or some political ideologies, you don't need to listen to them. You need to use your own head. You need to look yes. what you know you, you still need to if somebody comes to me and says oh don't be friends with so and so because x y and z i'm going to ask who are you to tell me who to be friends with i'm going exactly. to look at it and see whether it's advantageous to me or not and based on my policy me. and my vision yes yeah yeah but There's unfortunately still, this is not yeah. the case now yeah yeah it's it's a lot of people turning politics into a popularity contest but that's again, that also tells you at the end of the day, these people want to be reelected. So if somebody wants to influence, they go to the voters and they tell them, oh, well, this is why you should have your candidate support this position. And at the mm -hmm. end of the day, um, you know, a lot of these guys who pursue this pro Muslim brotherhood, they're in safe seats where they are. They can do whatever they want 
because they know that no matter what they do, they'll get reelected. If politicians feel there is a cost to destructive policies that create domestic problems, then they're going mm. to reevaluate their positions or lose their seats. You know what's what's even sad about this is that this confusion is even being now extended to areas which ones we thought that are uh, non negotiable to the United States, like the pressure for democratization and human rights in the region. Even in this, the U.S. administration is becoming somehow hesitant. You know, like sometimes they put the pressure. Sometimes they say, no, 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 we're not going to do this because of other strategic considerations. Sometimes even you find like it's, there is an exaggeration in using the word human rights in certain contexts that are not related to it. And sometimes uh, it disappears when it should be used. So this, uh, this is actually, you know, it's, it's, that is not, you know, you can't be taken seriously if you don't have a clear understanding of what you want to do and what you want to see and how you want to build your relations. Yeah. Quite, quite simply, if you apply different standards to different countries and different people out of personal dislikes or financial agenda or whatever, you know, you, you mentioned Saudi Arabia, it's very clear to me that, uh, you know, people say, oh, well, we don't like this one, but in reality, what is it about? It's about their interests. Who do they actually want to have in power? Somebody else somebody who will be closer to them and their interests. That's what it's yes. all about. Otherwise, why would they even care what some person in another country does or doesn't do? It has no bearing on their personal lives at all, other than what they can gain from having somebody else there. Exactly, exactly. I agree. Also, and uh, by the way, speaking about Saudi Arabia, I think the, exp the, the exp or the story of Hamad bin Salman is still at its very beginning. Like, give it a chance and allow him to do but what it, he's but doing. That's the, but that's entirely. Here's the thing: if people perceive somebody to be a threat to their personal interests, they don't want to give them a chance. They want to destroy oh them as early, yeah. as quickly as possible before they become more established, more, yes. more, more experienced, more uh have more re successful relationships that's what became obvious to me observing this entire situation for the past several years is that certain entrenched interests who had financial political gain from his predecessors and mm. from certain pro all guard pro-islamist factions that did not want Saudi Arabia to be too strong and who wanted to make political financial arrangements in particular ways, it became obvious that the people who stood the most to gain from all these endless campaigns were the people who were beneficiaries of these actions. Otherwise, not one person would care about any of what happened at all. Mm -hmm. I personally had no idea who Khashoggi, for instance, was until they started the campaign. I never heard of this guy. If he's so important, exactly. I haven't heard of him. <laughs> me yeah. too, me too. And uh, I live in the region, you know, and uh, no, no one heard of uh, So you're going to tell me that an average American who doesn't even, you know, know anything about Saudi Arabia other than they get their oil from there, they're going to care about some newspaper uh, writer, much less exactly. bother you know, you know, examining all the political intrigue on the background of this to figure out what's going on, that's just simply not going to happen. And this is what people with a lot of money on their hands and mm -hmm. a lot to lose from the success of somebody they see as an economic and political rival, they're mm -hmm. going to invest into manipulating public opinion, outreach, emotions, poorly, you know, poorly fit inadequate politicians who, who are not familiar with situations. They're going to use all of it to manipulate the desired result. It's very obvious that that's what's going to happen. The only thing is said is that there's no countervailing mechanism to counter these campaigns. There's no someone investing into real investigations of what happened. No one, you know, being funded to investigate the truth. You know, you see a campaign, you don't have. Yes, you know, yeah. You don't have someone being financed to say, well, who was this guy and who is he connected to? And how did it come about that he was in that place at that time? And who, who else was there? And who else would benefit from his death? Much and, more and than the from one From one yeah. small story, they made 
a big shadow that covered all the good stories that are happening right now in Saudi Arabia. But that Arabia. story, if you ask yourself who benefits from it the most, it's obviously not the crown prince. Nobody in the right mind would do anything that doesn't benefit them directly. There's no yes. benefit in killing some Washington Post journalist in, in, a, in a Saudi consulate. There's no political benefit whatsoever. It doesn't intimidate, it only creates, you know, a backlash. You want to kill somebody, you find some for sales to kill them. So. Yes, yeah, that's true, that's true. But, but who thinks this way, you know? I mean, most of the no, people- Well, actually, anyone, you know, the, the people who started the campaign, they didn't understand that fully well. But, they, but the appeal was just to create noise and, you know, create yes. this drama and bring in, and a lot of them knew fully well that nothing happened. You know, or that whoever was behind it had some other reason for doing what they did, but they wanted a result. So they built everything around the result and then they justify it. They'll, mm. you know, they'll make up a reason to vote a certain way. They already didn't, they have come to a decision. They just don't like that guy. They want to get rid of them. They don't like the crown prince. They want the old people back. So they're going to do everything possible to justify that result, even if it makes sen no sense upon closer examination whatsoever. It makes That's no true. sense for professional intelligence officers to enter an embassy with no with their real names, with their passports, with their faces shown. No one is going to do that. Not even you know an amateur is going to do that. Much less seasoned mm -hmm. professionals. And that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure Turkey Turkey had a role also to play in this. In and again, there's another question that no one asked. But I'll tell you something else. Forget average, you know, Joes not asking intelligent, you know, questions about this. They they don't care enough to ask. They're not going to think about it. But Imagine having hearings in U.S. Congress with human rights commissions, and you are having so-called human rights organizations interview Turkish mm. intelligence and not interview their Saudi counterparts, and you bring in a completely biased film, and you know, you know, with testimony from Turkish intelligence, and you try to say it's human rights commentary. Are you serious now? This is no way. This is mind-boggling. Yeah, having having you know pro outright political propaganda uh, be used as testimony that is not consistent with law. It's not consistent with ethics. It's not consistent consistent with human rights. It's not consistent. You know, it's the only thing you're going to get from that is disinformation. Everybody knows that. You can't do Definitely. something like that and use that sort of thing as evidence in a regular in a normal court something like that would not hold up yeah yeah they even claimed like they bought his body on some plane and took it back to saudi arabia okay if this happened how they, it in how they how they through the customs <laughs> like you know it doesn't make sense yes no, the story, not really. does not the story make sense. falls apart from day one if you ask mm. questions but the media didn't ask her questions. Why? Yeah, what's the role of the media? Who is, you know, your job is not to make heroes and villains. Your job is to objectively report the truth. On, on an investigation mm. and to find out mm. what's going on, what happened to that person, what happened to the body who had an interest. Your job is not to make decide who's a hero, who's a villain, to avoid medals and, you know, demand punishments. That's not a reporter's job. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But uh, yeah. So this but is another you know, another challenge to add to the many challenges that is happening but, uh, in our region. You know, yeah. They've created this emotional subtext that now colors all the reporting on Saudi Arabia whatsoever. It makes it impossible to have intelligent discussions on economics, on uh, Saudi Arabia's regional role, on on yeah. its relationship with other countries, on its relationship with the United States. Saudi Arabia is thirty million people. It's not just one guy. So that's true people, that's true and also is, is it's, exactly and also is like uh, putting saudi arabia in a difficult position while uh, for example in its war with the houthis now and uh, making it appear like you know uh, we should not help them because they are in like you know the bad people or so but no this is not no, no there's no excuse for terrorists case. killing civilians never exactly never. exactly exactly it this has nothing to do with who is the government you don't don't you, you know you don't like the government don't live in the country don't don't support exactly. them. don't host him for dinner but look at what's happening to human beings they don't deserve to die just because you don't like some political leader. So it's to be common sense, you know, it's horrible because I've seen that in conflicts, not just in this particular issue, but many other ones, people didn't like 
some political leader of some country because of his alliance with somebody else. And they say, oh, well, you know, but I said, okay, you meant his head later, but now focus on people and making sure that innocent people don't get killed. You know? Exactly. This happened, if you remember, with Egypt, even at the beginning mm -hmm. when uh, President El Sisi came in power and they started, you know, criticizing him and, oh, we don't like him personally, so we will support the Muslim Brotherhood. It happened. It happened in a very, in a very bad way. And it took years for Egypt to change uh, this position in the West toward this, toward this president and to make it like more open to cooperating with Egypt. It was very challenging. And, and the irony here is that they did not hesitate to cooperate with the bad people, with, with the Islamists. But, you know, the funny thing is, I love how people say, oh, I don't like so and so, but, you know, have you met this person? Who have you heard about them? You know, no. you read some media reports, you think that's the truth. Imagine that they, they wrote the same thing about you. How would you feel about it then? You know, you assume that everything you've been reported is exactly, but you don't know the guy. You don't, you know, what does it matter whether you like him or not personally? You don't even know who, who that is, you know? And, and what if the people chose this person to be their leader? Mm -hmm. I mean, so, uh, you have to respect that. By the way, even monarchies, monarchies also choose, you know, they would not put somebody who is completely unpopular and has no backing whatsoever in the front coverage of everything. I think that's ridiculous and people need to understand that, that, that even monarchies don't just, just randomly choose whoever and, and to people. There are mechanisms for managing the situations because even countries like that understand that there needs to be some level of uh, public participation in the process. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. So the fact that there is zero even political understanding how Saudi Arabia works, how Egypt works, how people's relationships to their governments work in other countries, you know, if you can't even understand the process by which somebody is chosen, who are you to comment on, on, on whether that country is, you know, operating the way it should or shouldn't? You know, one, one good example on what you're, you're mentioning here is that what we've gone through uh, during the COVID-19 year uh, here in Egypt, mm -hmm. at the beginning of, of, uh, of the COVID-19 crisis in Egypt, which was mainly in March 2020, uh, some businessmen tried to practice monopoly on the market. Oh. The only institution that was able to save the country from this monopoly and from a real economic crisis at this time was the military. And that is because the military is already in control, the military institution, I mean, because it has a very, uh, it has an economy of its own, as you know. Mm -hmm. so, Although it's something that is very criticized all the time that the military has greater power in Egypt and so, but look at times of crisis, the military, economic security, and any type of crisis, the military is the only institution in the country that can keep it going. So imagine if Egypt at that time was maybe an open market country or where the military does not have this important role, we were going to, to really fall in a very bad crisis at that time. So if you compare this to, of course, our ambitions about building democracy and so, which uh, a dream to everyone, including myself, but if you compare this to our dreams regarding democratization and to the reality we are living in, there is a gap. Until this gap is being filled and, and, and uh, narrowed, until then, I don't think we could see big uh, changes in, uh, in, in the systems of governance or the common systems of governance inside the region. One thing I learned is that the more people cry about how much they claim to see to want democracy, in reality, it's less about democracy than obtaining the results that they want. Because in the United mm. States, and I'm not talking about any other countries right now, just the US, during the COVID crisis and during other issues and elections, 2016, 2020, what I saw is plenty of people were very happy to completely ignore at least 50% of the population's interests. So long as they wanted the results that they wanted and when they didn't get it, mm. you know, they were happy to justify interference, subversion of democratic results or other people's choices and, and needs and wants because they wanted something else. So when given a free rule, people are not opting for democracy. People are opting for whatever method they can grab hold of that will guarantee their personal preference. The, the human nature is 
not about democracy or whatever. It's about struggle for power by any means possible. That's that's the that's reality. True. That's true. Yeah. That's why perhaps what we need to guarantee in the region, not building democratic uh, governance systems in the traditional way we see in the West or the United States or so, but rather to focus on uh, creating the, the value system that comes with democracy, which is liberalism, uh, religious respect freedom, human beings. Exactly, Do exactly. It to manage pluralistic interests in a, in a way that, that shows respect for other people. You know, in the US, there's an erosion of this ability uh, to, to coexist with people who have different views on a basic level. Mm. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. So until those basics are down, I can't, you know, these high ideals and institutions, you know, it needs to be built from the ground up. You can't suddenly expect a paradise from people who have no, you know, who, get offended by everything or who hate you know each other to the point that they're ready to call what the other people completely illegitimate if they disagree that's not that's not conductive to democracy or to anything else it's it's a guarantee for a lawless society exactly and and causes polarization and divisions that no society especially societies like ours like you know uh, those who are who has gone through the arab spring cannot cannot live with cannot uh, I mean cannot survive you know it, it will be very difficult to uh, to yeah I mean these institutions need to be safeguarded people need to be educated they need to be vigilant because before they go and start screaming about human rights so, so somewhere else they need to make sure that they themselves are informed about their own country they themselves mm -hmm. can manage their own institutions and they themselves are not being manipulated or subverted by foreign interests or, and propaganda so yeah, you know, and they are also hurting, hurting the ideals and the principles of human rights itself as you know an ideal, as 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 a principle. They are also hurting it by working this way by by using it as a, a political tool to make political influence or so. Uh, so we hope this changes. You know, I I hope so too. I think. There's a lot of work to be done. I think the mistake several past administrations have done is not pay attention really to educating the public, to put mm -hmm. more emphasis on just the political process and grabbing institutions and grabbing control of the messaging, but not really educating the public and not forcing people to think about the choices and understanding the principles the country has been built on. The people who don't understand the basics of constitution, the basics of civil society, the basics they cannot have make educated choices and therefore the people they elect to represent them will reflect that type of mindset. You, you, you have a destruction of the democracy, you have anarchy, chaos and lawlessness instead, you know, and exactly. civil servants who think of themselves as political elites, not people who are answerable to taxpayers. Civil That's servants. a very, very good point. That's a very, very good point. We are suffering from this really here. You know, it's all the time anyone who, uh, many people who are actually call themselves human rights activists or 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 even the, the civil servants, as, as you mentioned, the people working for the government and, and so are, there is there is a gap between how they are thinking about themselves and the and the work they should be doing on the ground or the influence they should be having on the ground. Mm -hmm. We yeah. are having this problem in in different sectors and on different levels in Egypt, and I think in other Arab countries too. Yeah. I I hope this crisis to which we are going through now will hopefully help people be you know you produce the type of leadership that can help you know break through all of this and kind of start creating the sort of initiatives that can rebuild a society in, or, you know from the ground up because right now i think even the people i used to respect they've kind of lost control of the plot so to speak they've kind of fallen into this reactionary mode of oh well but he said like this kind of outreach campaign setting and you know, just reacting to bad things that have already happened without, you know, really contributing to building anything on you. So I, I hope to see that start to happen. It already is to some extent. Thank you so much. This was an amazing discussion. 
Thank and you. I'm really grateful because a lot of the times, first of all, important things don't get discussed, analyzed, or reported upon either because you know they're too you know people are not paying attention they're chasing after some shiny point you know some some big event or some comment by somebody or because they're simply concerned about you know how that will be perceived by the public you know getting emotional reactions of people instead of exactly. uh, analysis i think these discussions may not be comfortable then may not be comforting but they are important Exactly. Before you start thinking what strategy you can use to shift the current things. You have to understand what's actually happening, why, by whom, who is driving these points. Then you can discuss whether or not this is optimal or whether something needs to shift and then how do you do it, who is best positioned to do it and so forth. But this is the basis starts with understanding, learning, appreciating, and then you can react and you can solve problems and you can of course. appreciate but if you just don't want to you know don't even report on something because you are too afraid or you don't like it then it's you know it's yeah. you end up in a situation where some everything is out of your control because you you ignore that when when because you were afraid of confronting something you didn't like exactly exactly i agree and uh, thank you of course for uh, for everything and uh, i always enjoy having these conversations with you and uh, i hope our talk today may have opened the eyes of of some people to some truths that are not usually told in the media about our region thank you so much i appreciate it and i look forward to seeing you back soon thank you thank you so much thanks bye